Hello, everyone. Quantum computing is one of the most hyped, but maybe one of the most misunderstood technologies that are currently in development. And I'm really delighted to have Ling Ji from Tencent here to talk, to talk us through it. I think maybe we should start with the basics, right? So what is quantum computing, Ling? Well, for me, I think quantum computing offers us a window to look through the universe. What I mean by that is in the 1970s, 1980s, when Richard Feynman first proposed quantum computing in the modern day age, he mentioned that the nature is quantum. So at a subatomic level, um, the, we are all made of atoms, atoms are made from electrons or quarks or something even smaller. And all of these things are governed by the quirky uh, superposition, entanglement, decoherence, etc. So, so all of these are all operating at a quantum mechanical level. And that's how the world really works. Yeah, so I guess it's this idea that when you get down to the really small stuff in nature, as you go down to the subatomic level, you get these strained interactions because of these quantum properties of the universe. And if we're going to simulate those systems, those natural systems, then we're gonna, we need a computer that will do that. And that's, I guess, the crux of what quantum computing is and what it's for. But what are, you, what are some of the applications of quantum that you're most excited about? I think I'm, I'm most excited about um, um, modeling the world at a subatomic level. Um, there are some better publicized applications such as optimizations or, or um, doing quantum finance as well as um, quantum biology. But I think um, at the end of the day, is how we model all the materials properties at the subatomic level to look at how the electrons move, how do we describe the world in, in their true nature. I guess one of the other applications that gets talked about a lot is the cybersecurity implications of quantum computing. Do you think that's a real threat or is that something that gets a bit over, over talked about? I think it's a double sword edge. So quantum computing can make things super secure, unbreakable, but on the other hand, it can also break into systems. So as um, everyone knows about the RSA uh, crypt, uh, encryption, so in, in quantum computing, there is a very famous algorithm called Shaw algorithm, and that's um, to factorize very, very large numbers into prime numbers. So things sound, don't sound that complicated, but to factor, say, a number of um, 10 billion digits, it might take the age of the universe to, to crack it. But once quantum computing is here, then it takes a split of a second. But on the other hand, a lot of uh, research, for example, in the US, NEST, they, they are setting out a competition trying to set the standard, having various um, uh, crypto schemes in order to make things unbreakable. So a lot of um, researchers, they are doing post-quantum uh, in order to use classical computing to make the crypto super secure. I think that's a pattern that appears a lot in quantum computing. The headline is really shocking and scary. You know, quantum computing is going to break RSA encryption and open up all of our emails to everyone. But actually, when you dig a bit deeper, you find that, well, yes, quantum computing can break RSA encryption, but people are already working, as you said, on NIST, on quantum secure algorithms that won't be vulnerable to quantum computers. And I think one of the big misconceptions about quantum is that it's going to be the best at everything, and that's not actually true, right? Quantum computers will be very useful, but only for a small or a, a, a subset of tasks. It's not going to be like a supercomputer times a million. It's, it's something slightly different. Yeah, yes, that's totally right. So, um, as probably most of the people know, there is um, two sets of problems. One is the P, that uh, stands for polynomial, and NP, non-polynomial. And the quantum computing only solves a subset of the NP problems. So, so lots of the things, um, A, it's not exponentially faster, mainly in the 
factoring into prime numbers, so, so that's um, uh, exponentially faster. In most of the other cases, say optimization problems, people normally use um, another famous quantum algorithm, the so-called Grover uh, algorithm. So that's like searching a database, you can make it um, still dramatically faster, but, but not exponentially faster. And those are the two algorithms that get talked about a lot, Shaw's algorithm for factorizing and, and Grover's algorithm for search, as you said. But I mean, we're, there have been a lot of hardware developments in quantum over the last few years. So Google very famously uh, achieved or said it achieved quantum supremacy back in 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. And recently, IBM said it had created a 128 qubit supercomputer. We'll get into what qubits are in a mm -hmm. minute. But how far away are we realistically from something like Shaw's algorithm being able to run on a quantum computer at a useful scale? Uh, I think we are still, um, um, yes, yeah, so, so all of these developments are super exciting. But I think people should remember um, building a quantum computer is extremely hard. So, um, um, yeah, Amit, you mentioned about um, uh, how do we build a built one. So let, let's go back to the fundamental building block. That's a quantum bit, the so-called qubit, which is in analogy to the classical computing, the classical bits, one and zero. And in a quantum computer, when we use superposition, that's so we can have a qubit that's zero or one or zero and then one at the same time. Or um, and the second important quantum property is entanglement. So that's um, the two two qubits. They can be linked with each other no matter how how long apart, how far apart they are. So. I can be on the moon and admit you can be on the earth, our two qubits can still be entangled together. And then there is the coherence. So when in a quantum system, say when we have entangled qubits, but they are um, in the real world, they are very messy. They, are inter they get lots of interference from the environment, from the noise and um, the system decohere, so they are no longer in an entangled state. That's when quantum computing breaks down in a way. So, yeah, so, so in short, it's still a long way away from a quantum computer that can properly use Shor's algorithm. I think the biggest number factor so far uh, a while ago was 21. Oh. <laughs> yes, so, so yeah, but, but we're also entering um, uh, into a near-term phase that's called the NISC era, so, which stands for near-term near intermediate scale quantum computing. So we can already starting to see some of these initial applications, which Google and IBM, they, they are showing and working with enterprise customers. I think the, uh, the, the idea of qubits is quite difficult for, to get your head around if you don't have a background in, in, in physics or a PhD <laughs> in, in quantum computing as, as you do. Um, the, the analogy that I like, and this is a very dumbed down analogy, is if a bit is like a coin and it can be either heads or tails, then a qubit is like a spinning coin and it, it's kind of either or both or not at the same time. And that is, a, a, I admit, quite an oversimplification, but it just helped me to kind of understand what I was thinking of. And it also helps to explain why quantum computers are so difficult to build, right? The hardware required to build a qubit is really, really difficult to get right, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, most of the times, all these um, um, qubits, the fundamental building blocks, they could be electrons, they could be photons. In the superconducting approach, Google and IBM are leading the um, su superconducting approach, so they're using something called a Josephson junction. So it's like one superconductor, another superconductor connected or separated with a nanoscale gap. So all of these things are very difficult to control. And most of the times they have to be at extreme um, temperature, almost absolute zero temperature in a superconducting case. Yeah, and you might have seen those um, those fridges that they have that kind of cool cool these tiny little chips down. So you've, if you see these kind of chandeliers of a quantum computer, and I think you can see something 
like that at the IQM stand where they've kind of created a, a sort of a kind of model of one of these cryostats. And that's all for cooling this quantum chip down to, to near, near to zero degrees to keep it cool so the qubits kind of stay in the state that you want them to stay in. And as you said, there are a bunch of other different techniques, uh, the superconducting qubits, there's photon-based photonics, and there's uh, quantum computing, and a bunch of other stuff. But the real challenge is how you scale up from you know, dozens of qubits to thousands or millions. We might need millions of qubits to actually run Shaw's algorithm because of the error correction that's required and things like that. Yes. And also, hardware isn't the only hurdle, right? There are other hurdles that need to be overcome for this become, to become a reality. Yes. Yes. So the longer term goal is to build a fault tolerant quantum computer. So um, uh, Amit, you just mentioned we need millions of qubits. So all of these are physical qubits. And then um, when when you read academic papers, uh, most of the times um, they are talking about this concept of logical qubit, which is. Um, for tolerant um, in, in a quantum computing scheme, you can think about a bulletproof qubit in a way. But to get to that stage, there is still a long way to go. So say uh, almost if we want to achieve one logical qubit, we might need thousands of messy physical qubits to surround it. So the 127 IBM qubit a quantum computer that's um, that's referring to 127 physical qubits, um, and the world so far doesn't even have one single logical qubit achieved. Yeah. But, but a month and a half ago, I think Chris Monroe's group they have made some um, um, uh, achieved some milestones in this space. So I, I think there will be some exciting progress coming. And that's why the kind of the, the qubit number can be a bit misleading, and I think why you need to take stories about we've achieved an X number, quant we've built a quantum computer with X number of qubits. You have to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt because the number of qubits in itself doesn't really tell you a whole lot about how useful that quantum device is. And I think some companies have developed their own terms, you know, like quantum volume or, or things like that, quantum advantage to uh, tell you how useful the quantum computer is, because it's not just the qubits, it's the way they're wired up, it's how isolated they are, it's how fault-corrected they are that really adds up to whether or not this hardware is going to do what it needs to do. And, but hardware, and there's also kind of the software that needs to be written, right? So we, you mentioned Shaw's algorithm and Grover's algorithm, but there's a whole kind of missing layer to this that we're going to need if we're going to, these machines are going to be useful, and that's the software and the skills, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, in, in the software space, there is, um, uh, some exciting development recently, for example, Cambridge Quantum Computing and Honeywell, they just announced yesterday they, they, um, they have formed world's largest quantum unit. And then um, there's a lot of um, quantum operating system, the new quantum languages, or the um, IBM, Google, Microsoft, they all have a new set of, so not C. C++ language, there is a whole new set of new quantum languages to learn. And um, um, my, uh, my Oxford classmate, he's starting a very interesting startup in the software space in Singapore. And that um, can translate any type of um, classical computing programs into quantum computers directly, uh, which can be then run on quantum computers. So in the near term, I would see a hybrid model. So say we can have some of the quantum computers uh, embedded in the high performance computing centers. And uh, we can have a combination when we run a whole suite of um, classical computing programs, but with certain parts where quantum com computing can bring the most acceleration, now we just use that particular part in quantum. The rest of the computing programs can be still in classical. And that's, um, I think that can still bring a lot of um, near-term advantage. Mm. What does the future look like, do you think? I mean, because uh, I guess we, we're talking about these machines as if it's something that I'm going to have in my you know, study, but that's not the case, right? These, these are going to be in research labs, and if I, if I, as a founder or as a programmer, access them, it's going to be remotely via the internet. So, 
is that is that kind of how you see it? Is that how companies will access these machines in future? Uh, I think most of the providers these days, um, yeah, uh, yeah. So so in short, I think it will be accessible via cloud. So for example, IBM probably they started offering these services a few years ago. Google, Amazon Web, Ser Amazon Web Services, Rigetti, IonQ, they are all offering these kind of services via some of the cloud providers. Um, IQM in Finland here, they have a um, unique selling point which is can offer it on premises. But, uh, but I guess in summary, one thing I can guarantee you, we wouldn't have a quantum computer in our study or bedroom like how we play mobile phone or tablet. Yeah, it's more like a supercomputer, right? It's something you access when you've got a specific requirement. I guess you might not even know that you're using a quantum computer. I think the way if you talk to Microsoft, if you talk to IBM, the way they're selling it is that you know, a company will come to them with a problem that needs solving, an optimization problem, say uh, a delivery company needs to find the best route for it to send its driver around to deliver thousands of deliveries, right? So they might approach a, a company like IBM or, or Microsoft or something like that with that problem and then that company will then go away and decide which combination of supercomputer, quantum computer, traditional computing is the best approach to tackle that problem and then they'll give the answer at the end of it and actually do I need to know as, as a you know, startup founder whether that's been done on a quantum computer or a supercomputer? Maybe I don't. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think you are totally right. I, I don't think you need to. So all of these things can be orchestrated at the back end. So um, quantum computer hardware and software providers, they can work in tandem and provide a whole solution and choose which bit needs to use quantum. The rest of the parts can be classical. Mm. So you mentioned a bunch of different startups and there's a lot of, the, the ecosystem is, is growing. Do you think from your position at Tencent, do you think this is a good time to invest in the quantum ecosystem? Is this something that you'd be recommending to kind of other people in the space that they pay a lot of attention to this or is it too soon? Yeah, I, I think it depends on your risk appetite. Um, yeah, so we, we can see there are so many quantum startups in recent years and lots and lots more government and private in, in, investment going into all these companies which is supporting great research and advancement for the whole human race in a way, which is fantastic. But how do we, how do investors know um, quantum computer is in this black box? How do you know the startup you are looking at is truly at the forefront of quantum innovation? It's, it's just very difficult to know. And at Tencent, we have, we, we call this um, uh, investment challenge black box paradox. Uh, and um, ourselves, we have um, developed uh, three lines of defense to look at at relevant stages, say from seed stage to series A, we are looking at certain set of achievements or criteria or milestones and series B to C, that's the second stage, and the series D to pre-IPO, and then there are some other criteria, criteria we are looking at. But, but out of all the quantum startups there at the moment, even even if it's, it's the most advanced one with, uh, with the current technology, it's still not possible to, to tell if it's, um, if it's a quantum computer who's actually calculating behind the black box or if it's classical computing. Because at the moment, with all the classical computing power, we can more or less simulate around 50 qubits or so. Um, I guess once people go beyond, say, 200 qubits, then that's, um, we are at a stage where you can use uh, techniques such as blind quantum computing or other quantum crypto methods to evaluate if, it's, if, it, if the claim is true quantum or if it's just a classical computing pretending it's a quantum computer. I'm interested in your thoughts on what the exit strategy for these kind of early stage hardware and, and software startups looks like, considering the fact that you know, we could be 10 or 20 or maybe even 50 years away from practical quantum computing at scale. I think um, we've already seen some good 
um, exits in the field. For example, my INQ has just become the first publicly listed quantum computing company. Yeah, so, so I think the, the market will tell how, um, how the world is responding to this inspiring deep tech company, but perhaps very early stage commercialization uh, and how, how the market will respond to it. I, I, but I think uh, we, we see more and more IPOs of um, uh, even, even the uh, very early commercial stage with really solid technology, but, but they IPO'd successfully. I'd love to know a bit, a bit more about Tencent's own investments in this space. You mentioned uh, IQM, who is one of yes. them. Is there any other? So can you tell us a bit about IQM and what made them attractive to you at the time, the investment and things yes. like that? Yes. Yeah, so, so I met the IQM founders about five years ago. I, I came here a few months before I came here for Slush for the first time. And what struck me best is, um, I think I mean, you have visited um, the Google quantum computer and we know how difficult to cool the system to the, the almost absolute zero to be, you wrote in your quantum book, it took two days to cool it down and one week to bring it back up to the, to the temperature, uh, room temperature. And the IQM has developed this uh, really innovative on-chip cooling technology. So that would really help with the scalability. And, as, and, and as some of the other advantages, um, they have very fast, for example, gate reset time and uh, operation time. So those are the advantages. And they also have a new concept that's called co-design. So say if you are enterprise customer, like a leading OEM, they can work with the customer and develop a quantum chip that's specially suited with that particular customer. I think on-chip cooling is a really interesting example of the kinds of technology that we're going to need if we are going to scale these things up. And it might not necessarily be that superconducting qubits with on-chip cooling are the, the end technology that it ends up being, right? I mean, yes. do you think that, because there's a bunch of different competing technologies, do you think that we've reached a winner in superconducting qubits and those are going to be the ones that are going to see us through to full-scale quantum? Or do you think that there's room for another kind of paradigm shift? Because, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, superconducting qubits were like a fringe idea that no one really thought was viable and then Google came along and built their quantum computer and now it's like the leading thing and it's used by Google and IBM and to a certain extent by Microsoft as well. What do you think is going to be the kind of winner in this race? Uh, I think it's um, too early to tell. Um, this is so, so, so we normally, when we look at investments so early stage, we will use a portfolio approach. There are just um, different approaches that have their individual advantages and uh, disadvantages. Uh, superconducting approach, the, um, yeah, it's, it's the most far ahead at this point, but some might go this curve and some might go like uh, slightly more steady at the beginning and a uh, very sharp, sharp growth uh, um, towards the middle. So um, iron traps is another, so iron Q is using iron traps. That's also uh, the, the qubit fidelity is probably the best amongst all the approaches and they can uh, operate at much more friendly temperature, but, but it's very hard to miniaturize the device, but maybe that's not so much a problem. Um, and um, there is topological qubit. Microsoft has been pursuing, uh, theoretically, it will be much better than iron traps or superconducting, but it's, uh, the fundamental problem is the, the particle itself is so elusive, no one has um, observed it properly in the experiments yet. And uh, there is also Psi Quantum in California. There were originally uh, leading professors in the UK from Bristol and Imperial College. And they have um, silicon photonics approach. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, the advantage is they can use traditional silicon fab and they can operate at room temperature. And um, they are already targeting millions of qubits, so one million qubits in the next few years. Yeah. So given the you know, dozens of competing technologies at vastly different scales with different potentials to either soar or completely crash and burn, what 
how can businesses prepare right now and investors, how can they, what should they do? What, what advice would you give them at this point? Um, I, I think to maybe two things. One is to to study the field quite carefully, uh, not just um, use cases, but especially for investments. So at, at the first stage, maybe even look at the find the main experts and uh, to look at um, scientific publications, those publishing nature science or physical reviews, and to look at if the theoretical method is solid. And then within each company, I think, um, uh, find out uh, what kind of use cases are there. I know Goldman Sachs, they, they have a um, research team looking at how quantum computing can link with black shows and uh, uh, speed, speed up the financial or risk calculations. And uh, some of the logistics companies are already starting to use the um, optimization part and uh, to make um, um, yeah, so, so only the traveling salesman <laughs> problem solved more easily. So, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of other use cases in uh, making thing, communication super secure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to be one of those really interesting fields to keep an eye on over the next 10 or 20 years as we see whether or not quantum computing actually comes to fruition and delivers all these potential applications that have been talked about across everything from banking to chemistry to health to um, cybersecurity. We are just about out of time. So thank you so much, Ling, for that. That was fascinating. And thank you for watching, guys. Cheers. Thank you.